My name is Klaska Havik. I'm professor of methods of analysis and imagination at the Faculty of Architecture and the Built Environment in Delft. It is my pleasure to present to you today a slightly condensed version of the presentation I gave at the Architecture, Culture and Spirituality Forum that was held last June at Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water. Before I start, I would like to thank the organizing team of the ACSF Symposium, Julio Bermudez, Sandra Iliescu, Trent Smith and Aaron Temkin, who have been so very welcoming to all of us and have, who have been so appreciative of my contribution. It is of course impossible to reproduce that moment at the site of falling water in the good company of all participants and attendees of the event in the extraordinary setting and architecture of falling water. But I will try to give a hint of the atmosphere, not by discussing falling water itself, but by taking you back to the renovated barn that was the venue of our conference. It was an architecturally amazing space in its own right, despite its seemingly sim simple and mundane nature. It was how the old wooden structures were ingeniously connected, reminding us that they had been connected like this for hundreds of years, carrying the roof that kept the cattle and hay dry and safe, and how even far back in time, they have been trees as a forest around falling water. These wooden joints speak. They tell stories of builders and farmers, of countryside life, of smell of cows, sounds of animals breathing or scratching their hooves on the floor, of the storm howling around the barn on a cold autumn day. During these summer days in June, we enjoyed the shelter from the sun, the wind coming gently through these narrow slits between the wooden planks of the facade, as through a porous breathing skin. We enjoyed the large and simultaneously intimate space it offered for our presentations, our dinners and our encounters. Our gathering in that barn, the architectural experience it evoked, could be called atmosphere. It was precisely the coming together of this objective spatial arrangement, the architecture of the barn and the mindful perceiving subjects of all the participants and attendees. And it's exactly this, the coming together of objective spatial arrangements and mindful perceiving subject, that is how the German philosopher Gernot Böhme defined the notion of atmosphere in his book, Architektur und Atmosphere, a book where he discussed the notion of Stimmung or atmosphere in a German tradition of Schilling and Schmarzschau and related it to architecture. It was a few years ago in 2013, that we prepared an issue of the Dutch Flemish architecture journal OAS on the topic of atmosphere with three experts on the topic, the architects Johanny Palasma and Peter Zumtor and the philosopher I just mentioned, Gernot Böhme. It was an extraordinary project and I think it was a project that um, was an example of the importance to address ambiguous themes in architecture, themes that are difficult to define in purely scientific terms, but that are key to understand and produce meaningful architecture. Some of the leading concepts in my work in the past years, and perhaps also some of the concepts here in the, that are discussed in the Architecture, Culture and Spirituality Forum. Uh, in my case, topics such as atmosphere, uncertainty, narrative, and experience. These themes may sound elusive, but I see it exactly as their strength that they cut across different registers and disciplines. Today, I want to speak with you about poetic imagination, because I think it is poetic imagination that allows us to deal with these ambiguities, to deal with architecture's elusive qualities, understanding the effective relationships that people establish with places. Relationships indeed that are simultaneously conscious and embodied, material and conceptual, spatial and temporal. Therefore, I take you to the world of poetry. And I'd like to start with a poem about the piece of sacral architecture. The Church of Saint Joseph in Le Havre, Normandie in France, built by Auguste Perret in 1957. It's a poem I wrote some years ago and it's entitled Shadow of Light. Light entered through the colored glass. A column caught moving moments. 
dancing purple patches. The sun threw a colored shadow on the concrete floor before my feet. A line of red and orange circles of joy that disappeared when suddenly the sun withdrew. But after they had left, the light returned and turned and turned around, appearing where the concrete seemed abandoned. And I could not make it come or make it stop. I could only try to be a concrete surface and wait for moments to appear. We'll stay for a bit in France and um, look at the work of, of Le Corbusier. Um, his version architecture was written in 1924. And here he said, the purpose of construction is to make things hold together. The purpose of architecture is to move us. And what I found so striking in this quote is the double meaning of the word émouvoir, to move, as it can refer to both physical movement, but also to being moved mentally and emotionally. And it's these two aspects of being moved that I hope to link. Poetic imagination, I think, is able to move us in a physical as well as spiritual sense. So what I will do is to draw upon the capacity of poetic language to touch upon architectural perception and to capture the spirituality, spiritual qualities of architecture that are able to move us. Sarah Robinson, in her recent book, Architecture as a Verb, focuses on what a building, and I quote, what a building does, how we feel and sense according to our buildings, how they afford and reinforce gestures and modes of perception, end of quote. So in her view, architecture is active. It acts upon its users and therefore it could be regarded a verb rather than a noun. So what she does in this book is to try to create an awareness of precisely what a building does, how it affects our body, mind, and spirit. It is remarkable that the performance of architecture is often seen on a mere technological level, measuring energy efficiency, for instance. The spiritual experiential aspects of architectural performance are often overlooked. The effect that architecture has on people, how people move through buildings and how buildings move them, caused by their composition, construction, materiality, the way light touches surfaces, the temperature, humidity, sounds, and all other perceptual qualities. These aspects are crucial to consider as a responsibility for architects who imagine future buildings. So the discussion on how buildings perform should play at all these different levels. And I argue that it's in poiesis that they come together. Poiesis is the Greek word that links imagination and the craft of making. And I think this is precisely um, a capacity of architecture to link these two. A practice of making combined with poetic imagination. You could say that design is by definition an act of imagination. Archi architects, of course, imagine something that does not yet exist. They imagine a future reality. It takes imagination to think about how existing spatial realities may evolve in time. And it takes imagination to develop ideas for possible futures. Literary writers are stars in balancing between reality and imagination in different ways. We could look, when we are interested in, in experience and atmosphere, we could look at, for instance, Marcel Proust, A la Recherche du Temps Perdu, In Search of Lost Time, where he describes atmospheres and uh, perception of spaces through the eyes of a character and through uh, perception and memory. We could look at surrealist writers, such as André Breton and here in the image, uh, Louis Aragon, who celebrated the transcendence of reality, offering alternatives to reality. Magic realist writers, such as Gabriel Garcia Marquez in Colombia, explored the magical dimension of reality. And the last image, um, George Orwell's 1984, um, the utopian and dystopian novels that could be seen as extrapolations of certain aspects of society. In the case of George Orwell, a critique on tendencies of surveillance and control. 
So if we can see novels as a means to respond to reality and speculate on possible futures, desired ones or feared ones, you could say each story is a response to reality, an imagination that's rooted in reality. And likewise, we could argue that architectural imagination is also rooted in the real, responding to questions that emerge from reality while providing imaginations of new situations, providing details that can evoke embodied and emotional movement. Both in the artistic fields, literature, architecture, and in the natural sciences, processes of invention, invention often pair a meticulous observation of reality with the imagination of alternative possibilities. Johanny Palasma, who we saw already in the issue of Oase on atmosphere, uh, and who is a dear mentor of mine, um, argued that we live in a constant dialogue between imagination and reality. He argued that the poetic image, and I quote, the poetic image exists simultaneously in two realities, the physical reality of perception and the unreal realm of imagination. The philosopher um, Richard Kearney, who wrote um, about imagination at large, um, distinguished two dimensions of imagination, the ethical and the poetical dimension, connecting ethos and poiesis. If we take this to architecture, we might look at the ethical dimension of architecture as pointing at the responsibility for architects to collaborate, to build trust among people. The ethical dimension of imagination could be a call to care, to care for sites, for situations, for communities, for resources. The poetic uh, dimension of imagination could refer to the idea of inventive making and making possible. It means having an open mind to alternative situations. Poetic imagination just it thus um, renders possible to develop perspectives of what might be. And this notion of the possible is not only an individual imagination. Actually, it opens up to trans subjectivity and empathy, skills that are much needed in architecture. And again, linked to this notion of ethos. Kearney states that it is through poetic imagination that a reader can, and I quote, imagine oneself in the other person's skin, to see as if one were, momentarily at least, another. End of quote. So, indeed, in writing, one places oneself in the other character. Um, and in poetic imagination, it is this transformation of, of inhabiting the other, seeing from the other's eyes, uh, that we could uh, also use in architecture. So what is at stake in poetic imagination? It's not merely um, an individual artistic form of imagination, but an imagination that considers the perspective of the other. As Kearney makes clear in the following quote, the poetical ethical imagination that we are advancing is above all an empathic imagination, versatile, open-minded, prepared to dialogue with what is not itself, with its other, to welcome the difference. This brings us back to Palasma, who also stressed this importance of empathy and compassion for architects. In the embodied image, he stated that without imagination, we would not have our sense of empathy and compassion or an inkling of the future. Also, Alberto Perez Gomez brought together architecture and poetry in his many writings. In his recent book, uh, Attunement, he related architecture to poetry, stating that both significant architecture and what he called a true poetic work are both not a reduction of reality, but quite the opposite. And he said, they are both a depiction of reality that enlarges our existential horizon by augmenting it with meaning intrinsic to its own universe of discourse. Indeed, our imagination is immediately related to reality, and it is placed, it is situated. 
It is through our poetic imagination that embodied experiences of place can be observed and expressed. Philosopher Edward S. Edward S. Casey, in his phenomenological study of the imagination, argued that we imagine with our bodies and in place. In architecture, the poetics is often found in the details, in the way things are made. And our engagement with the material world is often expressed in poetry. As in poems, we can find detailed descriptions of how we relate to spaces, expressing how materials meet, how objects move in wind, how footsteps sound on the floor, the steps on a stair, how the light falls on walls. A poem metaphorically takes the reader somewhere, evoking embodied experiences of imagined or remembered places. And not only that, a poem also has a spatial dimension in itself. More than a narrative text, a poem is spatially constructed. Its shape and rhythm matter. It is its composition, including the white between the lines that makes language dance, move, touch, and breathe. And I'll move to another poem um, that I made, um, that I wrote actually in connection to this um, issue of Oasa on Atmosphere. Um, in the same moment we were visiting uh, Johanny Palasma in Helsinki. Um, this is the Murmaki Church in Helsinki, designed by Juha Leiviska, Finnish architect, in 1984. It climbs, this light. It sings, as if I follow, sitting in a train, the rhythm of passing ditches, fences, furrows in fields, outside the window frame. As if I run, jump, hurdle. Sitting on this wooden bench in white and silence, I move along white battens, clambering over seats and walls, ledge, rim, ridge, lath. Choir voices start to speak and sing. They tumble, somersault. They dwell between the lines and shatter into silence. It climbs, this light. It sings. A poetic attitude to architecture, one could argue, is simultaneously a phenomenological one. It is an attitude of looking at the world with a certain receptivity allowing us to see things as anew with a sense of curiosity and wonder. Poets can perceive the most ordinary things in an extraordinary way, finding unexpected connections between objects, subjects, and atmospheres, between memory and imagination. Poets, said Bachelard, are born phenomenologists, noting that things speak to them. In this way, a poetic attitude to architecture, expressing and investigating how architecture moves us, may offer productive ways to deal with these ambiguities of architecture and maybe even embrace them. In poetic descriptions, a fused understanding of temporality can be at stake, as experiencing, remembering, and imagining can happen simultaneously. A poetic approach dissolves boundaries. It breaks down dichotomies such as subject and object, as Bachelard noticed when he said, at the level of the poetic image, the duality of subject and object is unceasingly active in its inversions. End of quote. It is in poetic imagination, as if the oppositions between subject and object, reality and imagination, individual and collective, perception and thought, the oppositions between part and whole, between here and then and now, momentarily resolve. And sometimes this happens precisely between the lines, in the silence, the pause, the unspoken. I will finish this short presentation with a poem. One that does not describe a famous piece of architecture, um, not sacred architecture built for worshipping or sacred experience. On the contrary, this object is a bunker 
hidden in a forest near the coast in The Hague, my hometown. And it was built as part of the so-called Atlantic Wall in the Second World War. Yet, even such a mundane building, a, a piece of concrete with a rather negative connotation, can evoke architectural experiences. And we may be able to read such an architectural structure with wonder and imagination. So here it goes, bunker. The further I wander through the woods, the darker it gets. Of course, I do know the paths, the sandy slopes, the roof of beech leaves, filtering the, sun the sunlight. I do know the way. There it is, the house on the hill, almost welcoming in that light. Could it really be built out of blind walls, the path that dead end streets? Come closer. Touch the rough material. Question how solid these walls are. What hides between the holes? Whose hands once poured the concrete? It seems to breathe. And that, that is a strange part. That it is nowhere black and nowhere really white. It is just how the light falls. Thank you.